of Beauty and Biz, where we talk about the business and marketing side of plastic surgery. I'm your host, Catherine Maley, author of Your Aesthetic Practice, What Your Patients Are Saying, as well as consultant to plastic surgeons to get them more patient and more profits. I have a really special guest today. His name is Dr. Eric Nuveen. Now, he's a cosmetic surgeon in a multi-surgeon, 10,000 square foot private practice called Cosmetic Surgery Affiliates and it's located in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, which I've actually had a chance to visit this year for the first time in my life. It was really nice. So this eight-figure practice includes face, breast, and body surgical procedures performed by four surgeons in their two on-site operating rooms, which are fully accredited and AAA HC certified. Now they also offer a plethora of non-surgical treatments performed by many ancillary staff in their med spa, as well as online store that carries their own skincare line. Now, Dr. Naveen and I crossed paths very recently. We were at the American Academy of Cosmetic Surgeons uh, annual meeting in San Diego. And Dr. Naveen, uh, we were in the practice management session. And after I spoke, then I listened to Dr. Naveen's talk and his was entitled, The Future of Cosmetic and Plastic Surgery, colon, Consolidation and Success. So this happens to be a really hot topic lately, so I wanted to get his take on it because he's very immersed in it. So Dr. Naveen, thank you so much for coming on to Beauty and the Biz. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It's a, an honor. It's always, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's a point of retrospect and and uh, life, but to, to hear the things that I've done is kind of weird to listen. It just, um, you know, I started off when I was six and I always wanted to do uh, surgery. My father was an orthodontist and he uh, straightened teeth. And that was wonderful to change the perspective and often the self-esteem of uh, often adolescents. But at the end of that, I was always frustrated with my dad because he couldn't fix their nose or their chin. Oh. And that's really where it started. And, uh, you know, today after finishing, you know, 14 years after college and, and uh, eight, nine years of residency and fellowships, um, and then 21 years of clinical practice, it's like a blink of an eye. And I, I know I, I sound like a broken record for us that are adding up some years, but um, what I think what's been kind of special about my situation is when I finished up a full formal fellowship in face and body cosmetic surgery in Salt Lake City, Utah, I had uh, also finished a year of craniofacial surgery at Toronto Sick Children's Hospital. So I had uh, a pretty unique uh, bunch of skills and also medical and dental degree uh, prior to, I did a total of two years of general surgery. Um, so it was interesting because I, I had uh, also along the way had taken a little time to fly some airplanes. And so I figured, well, gosh, how can I involve myself with a hobby, uh, with a skill uh, to help others and to improve the standard of care throughout the country? And I, I I take that statement very seriously. That was my objective and still is to this day to try to improve each and every day. And I hope when I do exit uh, that it will be at the top of the game. And I'm always uh, looking forward to that because each day seems to be a better day. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. So I, I finished my fellowship and I came to Oklahoma City. I picked Oklahoma City because the cost of living here was uh, very low. And uh, the opportunity to start off day one in a 10,000 square foot facility that I purchased um, was not something I could do in downtown Manhattan or other major metropolitan areas. So I live about eight minutes from my office and 12 acres and nice countryside and quiet with coyotes and hawks and owls. And uh, it takes me 10 minutes to commute to see patients and it's just been a fantastic choice. Uh, it is the middle of the country. So fortunately I get to use my airplane and go and visit the ocean often. And uh, so the, uh, the practice really started there in Oklahoma city. And I took over a pre-existing doctor's practice. He was 71 and did exclusively breast surgery. And I saw an opportunity to expand that practice. And fortunately, um, uh, God willing, it uh, did. And so I uh, purchased that practice from an individual, kind of the old school method, a handshake, a, a gratitude and pat on the back. And, and there I started. And, and did, uh, did, is, wait, were you in a different building? Yes. Yeah. From, yeah. The, from, so he was in a smaller facility and shared with a ophthalmologist, oculoplastic guy. 
Mm -hmm. And um, that relationship couldn't have lasted too long because I really needed to grow and I needed multiple operating rooms to do what I had set my heart to do. So my my plan from day one was uh, to come into the community, uh, meet all the other surgeons that did similar things and and open the door for uh, growth. And ultimately, I, I set the bar high. I wanted to be the most dominant practice in this region of the country. And I, I think statistically, we've been able to achieve that. Uh, I do Wait, about- Can I ask you two... something? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, out of curiosity, what exactly yeah. did you buy? Because what did he have that you wanted of value? Were, was that a shortcut to get into the community or what? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, there's an exchange in life, right? You know, you, you ask for, you have communication, you hope for a response. And in the relationship, with the physician was this gentleman wanted to exit and I wanted to come in. Mm -hmm. And he had a patient flow volume of about 750 patients a year. Uh, he did a very high volume of breast augmentation and he was very consistent year in, year out. He didn't offer almost any other procedures. So I saw an opportunity there just in the patient flow volume to expand and it did. So we sent out letters to 6,500 pre previous patients and inform them of uh, our expanded services and an opportunity to meet with me. And so the first month I was in practice, I did 57 major surgeries and I've never slowed down. Nice. And did you two, like, were you feeding off of his credibility? Did he have to stay put for, for a while for the patients to get used to the transition or how did that work? Yeah, that's, that's a really variable answer if you're speaking to the general public on that topic, because uh, it's all about personality, will, determination, uh, effort, uh, and I hope good counsel. Um, I, I think that's an often overlooked commentary is uh, you, you need to don't, don't do things foolishly because you think it's the right thing to do. There's been other people there before you, and you really should ask some good questions and don't be afraid to hear constructive criticism. Uh, it's, it's very common to think that uh, doctors have done very well in school and that that translates into financial or good decision making, and it doesn't always. So we have to admit that first and foremost, have the insight that uh, the others have been there and let's get some good advice. So for in my situation, I was taking over a gentleman's practice who had done uh, almost 20 years of exclusively breast surgery. So he had a very long proven statistical track record. And I'm very data driven. So I did uh, a lot of spreadsheets and demographics, you know, cost of living, cost of employment, and the goals that I set for myself in my business and kind of predicted in a business plan exactly what I thought would happen. And it's actually remarkable how close I was over a 20 year period to exactly what I predicted. It's actually freaky weird. I was off by less than $100,000. And in, in all the categories, which is pretty, pretty amazing, actually. But did he stay put? Uh, like, did you two work together or did he pretty much exit and you entered? Yeah, I, I made a, uh, a very thought out contract. There were some issues related to uh, his history that I needed to uh, insulate myself from and isolate myself from. So I did that legally and uh, he worked about two hours. And then he was released from that obligation. And then I took it from there. And at that point, I had come down two times during my fellowship, met patients, knew I was on good, solid ground of communication, and I was willing to take that gamble. So he exited immediately, and I took it over from there. So um, again, out of curiosity, because these are the kinds of things people want to know about, if yeah. you're taking over somebody's practice who might have... Um, some reputation issues or maybe some bad reviews do you how do you handle that do you just change the name and hope nobody notices or what do you do yeah do you well, over his website with his seo of 20 years of rankings or how does that work yeah you know today's a different era you know yeah. it's uh, 21 years down the down the road since then but at that point uh we did surveys we sent out surveys to patients we asked local doctors because I did communicate with every other plastic surgeon here in Oklahoma City, not always to the most uh, welcome response, okay. uh, uh, but they gave me enough uh, ammunition, fuel, and, and energy to try to approach the challenges and also receive the benefit. And the benefit was just a phone number uh, and a website. And that 
statistical uh, demographic that was reaching out was very consistent. And even though there were negatives, and I, I have yet to meet a doctor in the country that didn't have a negative of some right. sort, um, there are risks. And sometimes we take those calculated risks. And I, I think if we're, we're a wise uh, person, we're going to really investigate background checks, uh, histories, people they're cavorting with, their associations, their friends. Uh, it was my situation was abundantly clear. There were some significant challenges. And I have to say, if I uh, asked 10 of my colleagues, they might have questioned my judgment. But I just looked at the demographics. There was, there was such strong patient flow mm. and opportunity in that patient flow that I, I went for it and, and it was a good choice. But how does that translate to other doctors? Excellent background, listen to others, get experts, get lawyers, get accountants. Uh, you need to surround yourself by people you trust to the end. I mean, like people you'd give your kidney to if they needed it. <laughs> you, you really have to have that level of uh, faith because these people are giving guidance about your career and to take it lightly is a fool's errand for sure. What would you say is one of the biggest mistakes made that now you look at back at now and say, gosh, I wish I had avoided that one. Mm. Well, I got to be honest with you. Maybe, maybe I'm uh, just blissfully uh, happy, but oh. I can't think of a single significant mistake that I made at all. I okay. mean, it, it, I, I really, it, it has been an unbelievable career, unbelievable. And sure, there are things I'd, I'd regret taking on too challenging a case at too early a stage in my career. I'm definitely guilty of that. And uh, thinking that maybe sometimes I have more answers to a problem than I, I rightfully should have. Mm. And those can bite you. Uh, but, you know, it's experience just uh, leads you to those types of mature answers. And inexperience leads you to immature answers. <laughs> so there you have it. How long were you in practice before you bought that 10,000 square foot building? Oh, I actually bought it before I started. So I... I I had made some pretty savvy investments uh, during the residency and I saved up a great deal of money. Um, so I had no debt, I paid off all my student loans and I had enough money to uh, go in and, and pursue loans. And this was a different time. I mean, gosh forbid, a person leaves uh, residency now with four or $500,000 of debt. I mean, they've got a doctor doctorate, a, 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 you know, after their name, and that used to buy you, you know, a million dollar loan just for a handshake and a signature. Those days are long gone, uh, and it's really an interesting time, which really leads us to the issues of consolidation. Yeah, for sure. How did you know that you were you? So you knew you were trying to build an empire, like you weren't kidding around, like you. Or were you thinking about renting it out to others? Did you know you were going to fill that building up? Yeah. Well, my, you know, my mom says things to, that I'll quote often, and uh, I know she'll listen to this podcast, so she'll probably get a little tear in her eye. But um, uh, when I was a little kid, my, my mom always said, he's full of grandiose ideas. We'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Famous last words, huh? Damn. Yeah, yeah. So I, I've heard over and over from people, and I surveyed as many people as I could find. I went all over the United States, never spared a vacation to to go to a surgeon and spend time with them. I mean, I missed almost 10 years of vacation because every vacation was used to advance myself and my career for my patient's benefit. So I, uh, I had a lot of information, a lot of uh, experts out there, very famous people. I could just run down a, a lengthy list. And they, the, con the con consensus was a few things. No matter how big the space you get, you'll fill it. Just yeah. watch, it'll happen. And so I took that to heart and came to Oklahoma where things were a little bit cheaper and started day one at, with 10,000 square feet. And, and now we have another facility in Jacksonville, Florida that's uh, gonna rival that, so. Wow, and then when did you start adding other surgeons? Mm. Well, I was in practice for three years before I uh, took our first fellow. And so I would, count that as my first uh, experiment with having another full-time doctor with me. And that was a great experience. And so I've had uh, 15 fellows now. We have one every six months now. Uh, those fellows are all over the country from Seattle to Scottsdale to Park City and down in Florida. And so 
that's been a great journey. I, I would say that is a really nice way to bridge the gap from independent practice to um, developing physician relation skills. Um, when you're isolated in a practice, there are um, some strengths that come from that autonomy, but also some weaknesses that develop. And that dictatorial uh, unilateral approach to decision making can be a very challenging problem in, in various social arenas. So I would attribute that first step of growth to fellowship training and um, devoting oneself to the education and betterment of someone else is, is, a, is a really true altruistic art. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say there. Now my first associate was 2007. So I was in practice four years and took on a gentleman for two years. We knew his pathway was to leave, but we were fortunate to have him for two years. And that gave me another stepping stone towards uh, longer term relationships. And I, I'm still learning to this day. I don't have all the answers, um, but I will say that uh, there, I think there's three categories of doctors you work with. There's a doctor who's very skilled, very capable and very good and is just trying to bridge that gap of independent practice from residency, for example. And they're strong enough and good enough that they're gonna try to fight it and do it, do it themselves. Some of those doctors will see value in associating with another doctor and others will not because they are so capable and skilled. Uh, that's one type of doctor. And they take a different approach and a different mentality and a different uh, communication style. Uh, the next doctor is the do our doctor is completely on the other end of the spectrum. And that's a doctor who doesn't want to own anything, doesn't want to run anything, and just wants to show up. Mm -hmm. And they literally don't want to manage, even the thought of management is it just makes them almost sick to their stomach. Uh, and those doctors are really interesting because you can almost plug and play. You can have a system. Uh, do consultations, plug in the doctor, minimize their interaction, quite honestly, because often they're not the most robust in their skill set, and succeed very well. Because if they show up and are happy to do two or three surgeries a day, I mean, they're thrilled to go home and uh, maybe uh, that, that term that sometimes confuses me, work-life balance, which I don't have. Um, th that, that's the third type of doctor. The intermediate doctor is the doctor that I really strive for, but I'll take anybody. I mean, I, 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 I'm not going to say that we have a specific type of doctor that we're looking for, because honestly, all of them can work well. It's just listening to them, understanding them and respecting their, their skill set and their, their, what they're really looking for in their lives. So uh, that intermediate doctor is a doctor that wants their input heard. They want to be respected. They want to add to the quality of the practice or the contribution factor they want to contribute, uh, yet they don't want to overly be involved with the bills and negotiating contracts with anesthesia departments. It's just not what they want to do. So those are the three kind of broad-based categories of doctors I deal with. And all of them can be appreciated and all of them fit into a system. You just have to respect their differences. And, and acknowledge them because I think a lot of doctors aren't aware of which box they fit in because mm -hmm. some of the doctors, actually some of the, I'll just generally speaking, the yeah. younger patients don't, or the younger doctors don't know anything about business and they've never had to come up with patients and a marketing plan and paying yeah. bills and being um, at risk. <laughs> um, yeah. So they come on a little strong and not be naively, you know, and then there's the older doctor who might be burned out. But, but not willing to relinquish control. So that, there's nothing easy about that. I'm sure you take your time, you know, um, vetting these people, right? Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's really interesting. It, it's a, it has to be thought of, in my opinion, um, much more fragile than a marriage. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's analogies often made, but I mean, it's pretty easy to get out of a business situation and it's, it's much more financially challenging to exit a marriage, mm -hmm. uh, having been there. So I, I, I would say that uh, identifying egos, um, who needs to be praised, what, you know, what are their love languages? I mean, it's truly a tour de force of intellectual, uh, psychological assessment and uh, appreciation on both sides. I mean, we have to respect each other. We have to show that respect. 
but constructively we have to give guidance. I mean, it's really awesome. I mean, talk about fulfilling. I mean, this type of, a business relationship is just amazing. Well, I've seen some practices that are a true democracy. Um, mm. They meet, but they meet every week. They have the same values. They have honed this. Mm. Um, I know a practice who has kind of like a coach and mm. uh, the coach keeps everyone on, on task <laughs> um, mm -hmm. just in case things, they don't want any big problems that are festering and they're not talking to each other. So they really take it seriously and, and they have a beautiful, profitable practice. And then mm -hmm. others um, are just a dictatorship. They just, they, yeah. they hire some surgeons and they say, I'm running the show. Uh, you just mm -hmm. show up and, and appreciate that. And that's it. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and yet there's room for all. I mean, yeah. the, there's right. enough to go around and mm -hmm. uh, the greediness and, and the, um, you know, to, to think that you're the only one to do it the only way is just right. foolish. So I, I've been doing this for a long time and I've never heard the same story twice. You know, there's right. no one way to do this. That is right. for sure. I'm just right. loving all the creativity that is coming about that's evolving. And that's mm. why we're talking about this. But yeah. if, if I'm not mistaken, though, when I was listening to you speak, do you have 39 staff people? Yeah, let's see this week. <laughs> And that's a that's a, a laugh, but also the truth. It does vary quite a bit. Um, we have we have one person, uh, two people kind of exiting. We have three coming on. Um, that's normal. That's a normal week. So uh, we have a very open door policy. I say the same thing every year at a Christmas party. I say, listen, guys, whenever you want to leave, it's perfectly fine with us. Don't ever feel like you got to be the last one in the in the building. I just thank you for coming. Thank you for uh, being a part of our employment and just have a good time and leave whenever you feel darn good and ready. Don't, don't feel bad. And I kind of keep that same philosophy in the office. We tell people when they're hired, listen, we're, we're here in this life for a certain amount of time. You may be here for a long time. You might be here a very short time. Don't ever feel bad about it. Always address things with honesty and forthrightness. And if things aren't going well or you're seeing things differently, we need to hear about it. Let's just be open about this and mature adults. And so we do have a fair amount of turnover in our office, which is both financially challenging and functionally challenging. Um, so we've chosen kind of a redundancy and an overlap in employment that allows kind of a rotational cycle of employees. So I have uh, a set of employees that I work with primarily of course, I like to call them the A team, uh -huh. but <laughs> they're really just a, a group that that has uh, palled around with me, knows my habits, knows my mannerisms, and we work really well together. So we work together three days a week. We we typically do twelve hours a day, three days a week, and we start at six thirty, and uh, yeah, usually finish around seven thirty, eight o'clock at night. And no, I take no lunch. Uh, so talking about work-life balance, yeah, I'm not the model of that. Um, I love my work, love my work. I make no excuses about it. I am no balance whatsoever. Work, 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 because I love work. And I figure I want to work. And if I die at work, that's okay with me. Okay, <laughs> good attitude. Um, do you? Hopefully you give them lunch, right? Yes, yes, <laughs> as what's required. But I, it's so funny because you know, people of personality types, they tend to congregate. We like to hang around with each other. And, you know, we have a certain type of humor and we have a certain type of music we listen to. And it tends to be that these young ladies work their living butts off because they love that I do. Nice. So we're all, it's like a bunch of pigs in mud. I mean, we all love rolling around in it. So they take very little lunch, often don't take lunch. They'll snack on something. They kind of mope about it but they also are kind of proud about it and mm -hmm. so my little set team is uh they're amazing and i'm very happy for it. but we're just one small part of the big group we have a we have a big administrative group we have a very big uh, uh it division which i mean i i could just talk for hours about just our 13 different it groups that we work with it's craziness and are you planning do you go for um, patients all over Oklahoma, all over the nation, all over the world. Well, where, where are you going with that? Where, are you, I mean, are all these, like the, those breast dogs, was he getting all those just in Oklahoma City? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, so the, my predecessor, the person I purchased the practice from was 
was a, a, a very unique individual. He decided to basically do the Walmart service. So okay. he did, it was $2,800 cash, breast dogs, uh, saline only, cash only. Uh, and he did four a day, five days a week. So that's not a bad business model. No, no, he did very well financially. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there, there were some um, unscrupulous uh, issues and there were some, some financial uh, mi- misappropriations that uh, occurred. Well, that, the cash uh, only probably was a hint there. Yeah. 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 So um, anyway, but we don't run our, our business like that. So our, our business is, you know, absolutely to a T run properly. And, and uh, so what is our recruitment? Honestly, we try to focus on the central mid central United States. Uh, we do get patients, word of mouth, friends, et cetera, that come from all over the country. We have a very large military presence here in Oklahoma. So we have a lot of people that relocate to Japan, Germany, Italy. Um, those are the big ones and uh, all over the United States to different military bases. So um, that is, uh, has been a big area of uh, contribution to the practice success. Um, but really, I think it's been 21 years of of uh, tremendous service and being available to the patients. I So 21 years ago, I made my own website. Mm. I did it over Thanksgiving weekend. It cost me 25 cents. Nice. And I started something I'd never heard of. And I did made an online form entry and completely, there was no HIPAA. <laughs> and so uh, they just sent me pictures. And so I was getting, you know, pictures of people, body parts from all over the country all the time. And I was inundated. So I had never heard of anybody ever doing this before. And, uh, you know, of course, things have advanced to all the encryption and HIPAA policies. And now almost everybody has an online form entry system. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, 21 years ago, it was unheard of. I certainly never heard of it. Oh, that was a big deal 21 years ago. Good for you. Oh, yeah. We were doing 20, 25 cases a month purely from without ever visiting with the patient. The patient would come in from out of town. We'd see him the day before. We'd do the consultation. Then we'd do the surgery the next day. So yeah, it was just, uh, I have to say that that concept came from a, another doctor who I met in Connecticut. And he was doing that for wisdom teeth removal and just inundated. And I thought, hell, why not try that in our business? And sure enough, it uh, was a, a tremendous boost. That's how I've grown my own business. I always um, looked at all the other industries and I said, how can I adapt that to our industry here? And it's all, it, it, all you have to do is be a little creative and say, how can we do that here? And right. Yeah. Um, right. Now, uh, you also have an online store, a skincare line. You have your own mm-hmm. skincare line with an online yeah. store where they can shop. I'm always yeah. curious about that. Is it a good profit center? Is it a pain in the neck? Who's doing the fulfillment? <laughs> you know, I never, I, I'm not a fan, but. But it does it work? I mean, yeah. Well, first of all, I, I think you have to have a passion for whatever element of the practice your endeavor might be. So for me, I'm a surgeon. I do surgery morning, noon, and night. I hire people that have passions for things that I don't have a passion for. So I have an esthetician that does all the aesthetic services. I have two nurse practitioners that primarily do uh, non-surgical things and supervise my clinics. I have a skincare person that deals with most of the retail services. Um, Is it a profit center? Sure, it makes a profit. You know, I mean, it's probably 50% margins on everything we sell, but, you know, as far as a comparative, I mean, just to use real numbers, and I hope that's okay. I'm always very transparent about about the practice, you know, selling $10,000 a month of skincare products is, you know, that's $5,000 a profit. Mm -hmm. That's pretty darn good for buying hamburgers and shoes for your kids. (laughs) <laughs> I'm okay with that as long okay. as you don't lose focus on the big ticket items. I find that the vendors or um or stat like um estheticians take it very seriously. But mm-hmm. I just I, I watch the balance of how many are, how much of your resources are going into that when it right. becomes only one or two percent of your overall revenues. Could that money have been made easier or elsewhere? Or that that's my only comment there. You have yeah, yeah it's, it's a very, it's a very- Good point. And you know, some of the consulting services will focus on the quote, the the money left on the table, right? Right. That's the the common statement. Well, you're leaving money on the table. I mean, that's a term that I just want to choke people out for. Because you're absolutely right. If you have no passion for it, if you have no business doing it, please don't do it. 
Yeah. You're going to waste energy, time, frustration, managerial nightmares, legal liability. I mean, I could go on and on. Yeah. If you're really good at something, I think you should do it all the time yeah. because you're going to make much more money at it. You're going to enjoy your life. And I don't worry one bit about my skincare related services because right. I've got a young lady who loves it. So there you have it. Yeah. I mean, I, a practice is trying to train everyone on how to sell skincare. And I just think I don't get that. I just I think there's a better use of your time. Um, regarding you're doing a lot of non-surgical as well. You have a full blown med spa, right? Because isn't your is your philosophy more patient for life or one and done? Or where are you at with that? Yeah. Yeah. God, uh, you know. So right now, I my practice and I as 90 plus 90 percent of the overall surgical volume, I do about 2,240 procedures a year. So <laughs> it's almost mind boggling. That yeah. I did surgery. Yeah. And so I my focus is all there. So but what would be ideal if I were to step back and walk into this office as a businessman, which I like to do mentally, mm -hmm. I would look at the colors. I would look at the smells. I would look at how I'm greeted. I would see what, what the door presentation is. I would want to hear the music on the speakers. And, you know, is there a TV on and what's playing on it and what's being presented? Are there menus of services? What are the services that this offer mm -hmm. that this office offers? How is it displayed? Is it displayed on the wall? Is it displayed electronically? All of these things that would go through my mind if I walked to the office. And it's interesting because even though I, I suppose I'm in the position of CEO, I don't fulfill all of those things that I've just told you. Mm. There's always room for improvement. There's, and that's undyingly interesting to me that there's always room uh, for a person's improvement and the practice improvement. Now, if I were to say in a more ideal situation for, so I do about 90 major facelifts and facial restorations a year. Um, in, if I could ideally play out for you what I'd like to have, I'd like to have an introduction. I'd like to have uh, a credentialing period. I'd like to discuss their goals. I'd like to hear from them for 10 or 15 minutes. I'd like to uh, evaluate them and like to give recommendations based on their goals. Now, a quote is rendered, but I'd also like them to meet with an esthetician because as part of the comprehensive care of this patient is not only preoperative preparation for it in many cases, like laser skin resurfacing, but the postoperative maintenance. It, it is a really important integral part of, of ideal patient care. So it's not just a surgeon comes in, cuts, walks out of the room and never sees the patient again. That would be the, the most curt method of maybe managing the patient. But really, ideally, that's what I'd like to have. Do I fulfill that each and every day? No, I don't. I, I think if I were to walk in as a consultant, I would say, boy, you really need to kind of systematize mm -hmm. that process each and every day to have that integration that I think is more ideal. Well, as a coming from a perspective of the cosmetic patient, once they've invested in themselves on one body part, they will move on to another body part, especially if you help them with that. So um, I think you, you, you have a patient there for life psychologically. You know, yes, like once yes. you get that bug to look good or feel good and all of that, yeah, usually it's not a one time thing for the patients and nor should it be for the practice, you know? Yeah. The loyalty of patients within the cosmetic surgical field has been well documented. I mean, the average patient is like five procedures over a lifetime if you can maintain them for a lifetime. I wish and so I, I think at five. Yeah. That's yeah. Way if, over that. <laughs> if you look at, uh, you know, lifetime income from that, you know, our average price point per procedure is just about $11,400. And so, I mean, that's not a, you know, something we should uh, shy away from. And we also know that the cost of acquisition of new clients is much more expensive than the pre-existing ones. So it just, in every way, it makes sense to establish and maintain an ideal relationship. But it really starts from, from uh, the moment you meet them, being very direct, very honest, very, very open, and uh, also expressing limitations, just being a human. I mean, sometimes patients forget that just uh, because you went to school for a long time, you don't have all the answers. And reminding them that, that humbly, I think, is really important. Have you noticed a change in cosmetic patients from even, I guess, maybe pre-social media to now or pre-internet to now, like, w how do you see them now? Mm. Well, I, I'd say I'm a little bit biased by my current position and maturity of practice. 
um, probably 55, 60% of my patients, maybe even slightly higher are previous patients. Nice. So nice. that's, that's uh, a biases me because they already know me. They already trust me. They, you know, their daughter, their aunt and their grandma came. And so that's a, that's a no brainer. You should seal that deal. That should be pretty easy. It's the new clients, the new acquisitions that are, are, uh, are, are, have changed, evolved quite a bit. Uh, of course, during free money time and low interest rates and, and uh, COVID was, you know, the heyday for cosmetic surgery. I, I rarely met a practice that didn't show a significant increase because of time available for recovery, but also uh, liquidity was very high. And so that period is, is certainly changing right now. And we see seen a macroeconomic tightening uh, throughout the country and all the practices that I deal with. And, you know, you, but uh, it, it's a want and not a need. And thank goodness for that, because having weathered uh, housing crisis, uh, 2001 bombings, uh, there's a, you know, little dips that you take, but people want what they want and they'll put off their needs. They will not put off their wants too long. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, so I wanna switch gears a little bit because sure. you've grown this incredible empire. And then I want to talk about the talk that you gave about the future of cosmetic and plastic surgery and the consolidation. So can you go ahead and, and can you just always give like a brief talk of what your sure. talk is? Sure. Well, thank you. Thank you for, for listening to the talk. I appreciate it. So um, five years ago, I uh, sat down and I thought, you know, I'm not getting any younger. My practice has become a, a behemoth. And it would be very difficult to sell the practice to an individual for what it's valued uh, or what I'm told its value is. And so I was really struggling with that. So I thought, well, maybe I could fractionate it, break it down to uh, shares and maybe five doctors could split it up. And that would bring me some revenue towards a, an exit. But honestly, it still wasn't anywhere near what the actual cash flow and ongoing value of the practice was. So I got really frustrated with that. And I, I can, I, um, spoke and met with a lot of people from many different industries, auto industries, uh, tech industries, um, all over, as many people as would listen to me. And so my, my grandma always said, if you want to want to learn something, just call. And so I called CEOs from every website I could find. It's amazing how many of them were interested to spend just five minutes with me and tell me about, uh, you know, it was like I was a kid in, in high school asking on a school project. And so I learned and learned and learned, and I realized that where the value in the future of uh, our field, in my opinion, is in reducing redundancy. That was really the central theme. If you think about every garage you drive by in the United States and it's open in the summer, you'd see a weed whacker and a lawnmower and a trimmer. And gosh forbid, they're sitting there like 98% of the time not doing anything. What a waste of money. When one community could very well buy a set of lawn, a lawnmower, a trimmer, and rotate it throughout the community. There you go. <laughs> Perfect that's example. A great idea. Yeah. Yeah. And in, yeah. And in our business, that's exactly what we do. Almost every small boutique type practice uh, has an office manager, maybe a person in charge of social, social media, a front desk girl, and an accountant. And, you know, maybe that's the size that they're, they're comfortable with, but my practice had grown so big that I had, I, have, you know, five departments, I've got department heads in each department and then subordinates within those departments. And we have department meetings and, you know, it's all very corporatized and just everything was just going that way. So the more information I got, the more I realized that I could very, quite honestly, I could very easily just go to a a, a private equity consolidated group and just sell my practice. But what I did was I looked at all the available options and there were very few and still are very few actually that have gotten to a point of consolidation. And I realized there were a few significant weaknesses and I spent almost 2000 hours. That's no exaggeration, by the way, wow. 2000 hours. I documented all of it. I, during residency, I was very obsessive. So I documented every hour I ever did during residency. And so I have that all written down. So I figured, you know, I'm going to keep this up. So I documented all the time I spent on the phone at conferences, at meetings uh, with private equity groups. And uh, 
I learned a great deal. And what I learned was uh, the private equity groups uh, often contributing some form of financing. So they consistently wanted to take plastic elective surgery and shoehorn it into the models that they knew. And those models were gastroenterology, ophthalmology, dermatology, insurance-based accounts receivable. Um, their due diligence process was very far into a cash-based system. They didn't even understand that we were prepaid for surgery, you know, a month in advance. It was just, whoa, where's your accounts receivable? And there's no accounts receivable. They, yeah. Yeah. None ever. So I had, I was really like walking into these people that I felt I was the ignorant one, but they had absolutely no understanding of what I was talking about. So it was actually, I saw that as a great opportunity to, I mean, I always love somebody who's willing to listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I had a great time kind of going through so many different groups, speaking to different levels, all the way up to CEOs of these private equity companies, and just hearing what was pleasing to them and what they were scared of. Mm. What are and they that, scared of? Oh my gosh. I mean, the list could be very long. Uh, key operator dependency issues. You know, if there's only one doctor in a practice, how can you show me in a, on a cash-based system that your 90 day and 120 day revenues are going to be there when I'm used to waiting for accounts receivable for 120 days. So they, they wanted security, you know, and, and they this want is predictable always, revenues. And yeah, how do you yeah. say that in our industry? You know, that's right. And all you can do is say, well, I've been in business this 21 years and it's gone pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I just kept on telling him that, listen, look at the books, look at the data, look at the, the, the cash system is, you know, a 40 to 60 percent profit margin. Mm -hmm. You guys are arguing over 13 to 17 percent in dentistry. I mean, it makes no sense to me at all that you're wasting all this time with dentistry when you've got a cash cow right down the street. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it just over and over again. And then one day I got a call back from one of the CEOs. And I was in the Atlanta airport at the time, returning from a, a meeting with another private equity group. And he said, Eric, we like what you've been saying. We've been really talking about it and we want to meet with you and your group. So that was, I mean, I, I almost cried. I'm telling you, my hair stood up in my arms. I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, finally, it took me four years to hear that type of response that I was hoping for. And, you know, speed ahead and the tides are turning. There's certainly a tipping point um, of familiarity, understanding and acceptance. Uh, and the world of cosmetic elective plastic surgery is filled with uh, people that make a great deal of money compared to the average person. And they're very autonomous. And this is a, 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 a tide that's going to take a long time, uh, but that's okay. That we're, we're in this for the long haul. This is a 10-year project. This is not a one-year project. This is a 10-year project. And I really came up with that idea with a lot of my buddies in construction. And when they look at a thousand acre plot, they're not thinking about you know one year. They're thinking about 10 years and building schools, community parks, uh, restaurants, everything that's a part of urban development. And I just thought that's, that's the kind of approach I want to have in this industry is a 10-year plan. So uh, really that led me to some partners with some colleagues I've known for 25 plus years, all of them. Surgeons have, or business people? Yeah, these are all uh, other surgeons that oh. have been extremely, you'd know all their names if okay. I mentioned them, but I won't mention them because they didn't give me approval right. to do so. But um, they're very well-known people that uh, you would know immediately and uh, people that after conversations just like we're having, came to the realization that um, the future is very strong when you consolidate mm -hmm. the strength. And this really comes from the relationship I've had with my wife and my fellows and my partners is that we are always stronger together than you are separately. Always, always. And once people get that mentality shift accepted, they go, ah, I get it. So we can have one accountant for the entire system. That's one cost. We have one CEO, one procurement expert, one person that's saving us 20% on Allergan or Galderma, um, just 20% right there of negotiating power. When you've got a $50 million a year cash flow company and you sign exclusive contracts, you're gonna get tremendous buying power strength. 
And it, it's just over and over again. I could go on and on, but I, I hope that's exciting for the viewership. And are you consolidating the HR, the hiring, the managing? Because I find um, the surgeons, the number one challenge is staff. They they mm -hmm. are so, especially after post-COVID, they're so done with staff. Like they're, yeah. uh, you know, is does it include that? Because I can see a lot of practices yeah. thinking, oh my God, if I could get this off my plate and get back to doing mm -hmm. what I like to do, which is surgery, yeah. I'd yeah. be a happy clam right now. And I'm and they're, I'm not. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly the type of uh, person that uh, we're looking for. Um, and, you know, to try to make this segue a little bit, uh, the goal is to have 50 practices that are like-minded, utilizing a centralized uh, call center, centralized HR, centralized procurement, uh, the buying power of, you know, a $150 million a year company is, uh, just puts you into a totally different league. Um, we want doctors to maintain autonomy if they want to. So we offer a number of different avenues to try to become partners, and it has to be a partnership. Uh, there are people that just want an exit plan, and we provide that exit plan. Uh, there are people that want administrative roles and responsibilities. There are people that want equity in an ongoing and very rapidly growing corporation uh, that pays dividends. And so we have avenues for all those different types of people, and we have avenues for people that just want to show up and work. Um, I have a couple of people right now that, so we're constantly interviewing, we're constantly evaluating practices and you always learn something from that, those, those, uh, communications. Are you involving private equity or is this a physician led consolidation? Yeah, that, actually the answer is yes. And yes. Okay. Um, ultimately in order to fund the, uh, growth, um, if you study almost every other industry, there's a reason that loans exist. Yeah. Uh, I mean, why, why not just put it on your shoulders? Well, because honestly, there's a point of growth that you need acceleration and you need to get through a, a bridge, a gap that costs money. And it's, uh, it can be a pretty substantial amount. Yeah. So the initial phase of development is a minority partnership with uh, private equity where we maintain 80 plus percent of ownership and all decision-making rights um, exclusive of a few constraints uh, with utilization of funds uh, that are appropriate to any financial term to any company. And, uh, but it is a board run by, uh, through and uh, about physicians. So the board is made up of decision-making powers by physicians. And the um, business people are also on that board? Yes, they have one seat at the board at the table. Uh, they do have some, uh, again, you know, lots of details, but ultimately decision-making powers of specific hiring roles, uh, veto powers do exist, but they're extremely limited due to the minority position. Gotcha. I did, it's a miracle though. I've worked with, I mean, when I get in, um, when there are more than three surgeons in a room, we have a tough time making a decision. So, yeah. you know, good, good for you because I, I can't yeah. imagine all of them coming. How does that work? Can you get a decision made? Yeah. 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 Well, I, I think it, it, again, it all goes back to what I tried to form, uh, formally kind of describe. You have to have this mental shift. It's not about me anymore. Yeah. It's about the entity. It's about growth. It's about the consistency of quality of care. Mm -hmm. And I think those words play very strongly amongst even egocentric physicians. Mm -hmm. So, but getting that shift from me, 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 now I have a two-year-old and he's constantly saying mine, mine, mine. And I just, I got to take a video of it because it reminds me so much of the first time I meet with a doctor who's got, been a very successful doctor in there. They've got these barriers that are so visible. I mean, you can just palpate and uh, trying to get through that to, to a level of, of greater understanding that this is a societal shift. Mm -hmm. You can either sit back and wait, or you can be a part of it. If you join early, you're going to be in a position of more directorial involvement. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a higher equity value and what happens if you look at the math, and it's pretty simple stuff. I'm, I'm the, not the smartest guy in the world, but I do work hard. So if you look at the math, it's really simple stuff. When you add practices to a group, it becomes stronger. 
when you exit, meaning when you sell it to a larger fish, so a small fish is eaten by a bigger fish, and that's the principle at hand here, is that a private equity group comes along and says, this is a prosperous company. They're running very efficiently. They do good business. I want to buy them now before they get too big and too expensive. And then there's an equity transition. And then that doctor can consider, do I want to cash in my equity or do I want to stay on for the next bigger fish that comes along? And it's just a pretty simple process, but you have to buy into it mentally. You have to understand that ultimately it's not about the individual practice anymore. It's about the opportunity to take best practices from each location and formulate the best practice. Mm -hmm. Because I can tell you after spending so many years and so much time with all these other practices, there are some things that fall way outside the standard of care. And it's readily available. And I'm very research oriented. I, I'm constantly studying and I don't really do much else except fly airplanes. So for me, um, I, I love trying to find out, you know, what is the enhanced recovery after, uh, after surgery? What is the fastest way to get a patient home? What is the most efficient way? What is the safest way to reduce DVTs and blood clot formation and complications after surgery? That is just th th thrilling to me. And having that energy and enthusiasm and being able to transfer to multiple practices. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know what to say. This is the greatest life ever. I would okay. love to have that. So when I can find people with similar like-minded ideas, then we, we blend pretty well. And the decision-making is always about what's best for the patient because the financial returns will come. They will come as a result of running the business properly, running it ethically, morally, keeping track of every dime appropriately and, and always best practice for the patient. So um, because this is a business and marketing podcast, I have to ask about the marketing. And yeah, the marketing. Sure. is yeah. the branding now a big name? Like your name is Olympus Cosmetic Surgery. Is it now like um, Dr. Smith Plastic Surgery um, by Olympus mm -hmm. or how does that work? And then who does who does the patient attraction now? Does everyone yeah. have a big ad budget and the, the front office handles all the How does that working out, the advertising? Yeah, well, it, it's uh, always evolving. Um, yeah. The current situation is that all the practices are independent, but we're consolidating our services. Gotcha. Now, I, I do view in that 10-year time plan that I've told you mm -hmm. that there will be a central theme, a central title, a, a central logo. Um, we have our subgroup. We have our website related to Olympus Cosmetic Surgery Group, where it's really in the stages for information for uh, future acquisitions or partners to find us. So it's not a centralized advertising platform. It will be, uh, there's no question that's inevitable. But right now in each individual location, we're trying to find the most successful practices and they're successful for a reason because mm -hmm. they've proven their method successful in their region. So if they're dominating, we don't want to rock the boat and dislodge that, that dominance from that area just because we think we know better. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's a good idea. Um, you know what? I want to wrap it up now. I normally, yeah. I'm afraid to ask, you know, cause I like, I usually like to ask, um, tell us something we don't know about you. So if you can't say that you fly planes, because we already know that, um, <laughs> what, what's another one? Cause I'm, you are a very interesting person. <laughs> Well, I don't know. I appreciate that. Um, well, gosh, um, I would say uh, if I were to to say the thing that that uh, you know, I, I I've said it all the time. I'm not not the smartest guy in the world, but I do work my ass off, and I mean that at a much deeper level than I'm 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 admitting. Uh, I I think that the interest and the passion that I have for studying humanity mm -hmm. is is unparalleled. I absolutely love every moment of this life. And when I go, it'll be just fine with me because I've lived a full and complete one. But just the, the interactions between the highly intelligent people, mm -hmm. investment bankers, a private equity group leaders. I mean, these people, if I were a little kid and somebody said, someday you're going to be hanging out with all these people that went to the best schools in the country and were top of their class in every way, and you're hanging out with them and you're doing pretty well. I'd say no way, you know? So it just, the, the passion has, is there for me. And um, 
I, I would just say if, if I could surround myself with people with equal or similar passion, as I know you have in your field, I mean, gosh, I've, I've known you for like 25 years, I think. So, yeah, so, I needed to yeah. be in this field to hang in there. Yeah. 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 Well, and so you can... have to have that undying, never say die, never quit passion that is, is, is palpable. So other know, others know it. And, and I somehow have been blessed with that gift. So thank you for allowing me to say that. Congratulations. And thank you for your father for being an orthodontist. I had braces a million years ago, and I'm so <laughs> grateful. It was a life changer. Looking back now, if I hadn't had braces, oh my gosh, it would be a different story, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, Dr. Naveen, how can people get a hold of you? I'm sure there's plenty of uh, surgeons who are interested in your business model. It's very yeah. unique. And I, and I find it's very... Um, um, multifaceted. It seems like it, you don't have a, a process in ink right now. It's a moldable, flexible, uh, fluid process because you're evolving, right? Yeah, I, I, that's a good way to look at it. There are some uh, rigid elements that you mm -hmm. can't hear from due to the relationships, mm -hmm. um, but we're always learning and it, we got to have that attitude. I mean, if you look at some of the other groups that have uh, attempted to go down this pathway, they've really had some terrible problems. And, and, and actually it's been a wonderful lesson because you look at what they've done and you're like, well, of course that wasn't going to work, you know, mm -hmm. lifestyle lift. I mean, I could go down the road. There's, there's been probably 10 that are examples of just uh, poor business practice or lack of transparency or lack of partnering, true partnering. It's an overused term. It's mm -hmm. one that you really have to focus on. It's, it's got to be a partnership and people have to see eye to eye in the relationship. So yeah, we'll continue to learn and uh, evolve with the people that uh, want to join us. My, my contact is probably best just as I give to my patients uh, each and every day. Give me a call. Give me an email. My email is fxfaces at yahoo.com, fxfaces at yahoo.com, or uh, call my cell phone. But uh, also you can Google. You can get me there as well. My, my telephone number is openly published. It's uh, 405-550-7522. All right. Well, it has been a pleasure having you on Beauty in the Biz. I really appreciate it. I'll see you again at a conference coming up. Looks like you're traveling. Everyone, Everyone's traveling again. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'll tell you any, any time if there's another in, interesting issue you'd like to discuss, I, I do lots of other things uh, un, unrelated to this topic, but other business things with many different startups and techs and stuff. Great. So I'm always yeah. interested. Yeah. So we'll talk some more. All right. Thank you, everyone. That's going to wrap it up for us for this session of Beauty and the Biz. If you would, please subscribe or and or review Beauty and the Biz. I really appreciate it. And then if you've got any comments or feedback for me, you can certainly leave them on my website at katherinemaley.com or you can DM me on Instagram at katherinemaleymba. Thanks so much. We'll talk again soon. The fastest way to success is to model other successful surgeons who have what you want, but you can only see their results, not the path they took to get there. So you continue to jump from one thing to another, hoping to find something that will work for you too. But it rarely does. So try this shortcut instead. It's guaranteed to move you forward. I compiled my intellectual property to grow cosmetic revenues, everything I've gleaned over the years into one playbook of the most successful practices and what they do to win. Go to cosmeticpracticevault.com and let's grow your cosmetic revenues.